All right, well, thanks everyone for coming to this Soul Winning Workshop, our third one. And what we're covering today is actually very narrow in focus, and, but it's also one of probably the most important things to get down and to understand and to be comfortable with when you're giving the gospel to someone that's worth stressing eternal security. This essentially is the gospel. I mean, I don't want to downplay everything else that we've covered in the, you know, in the basic outline and, you know, explaining people are sinners and especially Jesus Christ dying and being buried and rising again from that. That's all important. So this, I'm not, I'm not downplaying that except where we are, especially in America, the vast majority of people have heard the story of Christ. Most people no, I mean, they've even heard that Christ was God in the flesh. You know, there's, there's the majority of people that you talk to are going to be familiar with that. And what we need to make sure we're stressing and, and you know, I'm not saying to leave any of that stuff out, but the, the, the focal point, depending on the situation, but most likely the, the vast majority of the time, you're going to have to spend a lot of time dealing with eternal security. Because this needs to be understood in order for people to be saved. And turn to 1 John chapter 5 if you want. I'm going to explain this. And I oftentimes will use this passage of Scripture to explain to people that if you don't believe in once saved, always saved, if you don't believe that your, your eternal life really is eternal, really does last forever, then you are not saved. And one of the scriptural references I'll go to to, to show people this, and you know, when I, when I show people this, I try to do it tactfully and in love. I'm not attacking them and saying, oh man, you're not even saved. You know, the whole point is to get them saved. But the problem is oftentimes you run into people that think that they're saved. They go to church, they think they're saved, they think everything's just fine, and they probably think you're saved too. Very dangerous position to be in though if they really aren't saved, if they're not trusting in eternal security. Eternal security encapsulates the entire gospel because that is the only belief that you can have where you are completely, 100% trusting in Jesus Christ. That, you know, anything else, if you can lose your salvation for some reason, then you're, it's boiling down to a works-based salvation. And this is what the nine, over 90% of the people that we talk to will have this issue. So this is one of the most important tips that, that you can get down. And when you practice, we're going to practice after I do a little bit of teaching today, we're going to practice just going over this point, this topic of making sure people understand what eternal life is, that it really does last forever. Because the other, the other aspect of this is that most of the time, people simply don't get it. Oftentimes, that is what is preventing a person from getting saved is just the fact that they don't, they don't quite grasp it. They don't quite understand. You know, you can hear things. People hear, oh yeah, we're saved by grace through faith over and over and over again. But when you start making applications in that and, and really engage the person in conversation, that's when you start to understand what do they really believe and you get them thinking about it too. Oftentimes when we ask people, you know, the first question, hey, do you know for sure if you die today you're going to heaven? They'll say yes. And they'll say, well, how do, how do you know that? Well, I believe in Jesus. And then when we follow up and say, well, can you ever lose that salvation? A lot of people never have even thought about that. A lot of people, it's kind of like a new, like, oh, I don't know, you know, and they start thinking about it. But this is extremely important for salvation. And if you look down at 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse number 10, I have this highlighted in my Bible. Not because I don't know where it is, but because it's an important place that I want people to be able to see and, and show them that, uh, that this is extremely important. 1 John 5, 10 reads, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. So I will show this to people and explain it the way I'm going to explain it right now is that this verse is saying that if you don't believe God, you are making him a liar, right? And that makes sense. If I were to tell you I have a blue car 
If you don't believe me, then what are you doing? You're saying, no, you don't. Right? You can either believe me and say, oh yeah, you know, he's got a blue car because he says he has a blue car. Or you can say, I don't believe you, which would mean that I'm lying when I say I have a blue car. Right? I mean, it's a silly example, but that's what he's saying here in his verse. Saying, Look, either you believe God or you're calling God a liar. We have God's word. You either believe what his word says or you make him a liar. Now, he explains this a little bit further. He says, um, why do we make God a liar at the end of verse 10? Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. So if we don't believe the record that God gave of his son, then we're calling God a liar. And then he tells us what that record is. What is it that we have to believe or else we're making God a liar? Verse number 11, and this is the record. That God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. So there's three points I always point out that's in this one verse. Verse number 11. There's three aspects to this, to this sentence, if you will, that of this record that God gave of his son. First, it says that God has given to us. If it's given, it's, it's a gift. It's, it's given for free. It's not based on our works, on our merit, how good we are. It's not based on our obedience to the law. It's given. Um, the next part is that it says um, eternal life. He hath given to us eternal life. Eternal means forever. By very definition of the word eternal, eternal means forever. Forever and ever and ever. Now, if, if God gives you a gift and it's life, but then he takes it away from you later, that's temporary life. That is not eternal life. If you end up going to hell for some reason, that is not eternal life because hell is death. It's a place of death and destruction. That is not a place of life. So if there's anything you can do and God's going to send you to hell, then you don't really believe that you have eternal life. And then the third part, and this life is in his son. It's only through Jesus Christ. You have to receive that through his son. That is the three things that a person has to believe or else you're making God a liar. According to this scripture right here, Verse number 12 says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Oh, oftentimes I'll start off when people say, Oh, no one can know for sure if you're going to heaven or not. Yes, we can. And this verse, verse 13, explains that, that we can know that. We can know it for this very reason because God has given us eternal life through Jesus Christ. It's given to us as a gift. But you can see from that verse, look, if someone, so for example, if someone believes that it's a gift and someone believes that it's eternal but it's not through Jesus, they're making God a liar, right? If they say some other prophet, some other person, some other God, he gives me this free gift, it's eternal life. You've got two out of the three things. But if it's not through Christ, you're making God a liar. Or if you say, well, yes, it's eternal, and yes, it's through Christ, but I have to work for it. Right? Well, then it's not a gift. It's not given to you. Um, again, you're missing two or three. And then the same thing, if you don't believe it's eternal, if you believe you can lose it, if you believe that it's temporary, whatever, then you are not saved. You're calling God a liar. So I, I point that out. Now, in order to get this point across, of something being lasting forever, there's two illustrations that I like to use. One of them is the idea of giving a gift. The other one is the idea of being born again. So when you give a gift, excuse me, girls, be quiet. When you give a gift to someone, that, that encapsulates everything that we just read here in 1 John chapter 5. It's given to you, it's free, and the gift that God is giving is eternal life that lasts forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I have some, I've got a lot of verses down here. I'm not going to go through every single one of these. I, I kind of have these on here for your reference. It's on the front and the back page. So um, there's, a, there's a few that talk about the gift, you know, like um, Romans 6, 23 talks about a gift. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you save through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So I'll go to these verses and explain, okay, here, you know, God says this is a gift. God says eternal life is a gift. And then really just break down what does a gift mean. And sometimes it, it might sound like it's real stupid simple, but we need to break it down that, that small so that 
people can fully grasp instead of looking over the fact that it's a gift really understand hey this is a gift this is free because if I have to obey God's law in any degree in any way whatsoever that's not a gift I'm working for it I'm earning it I'm doing something for him if I have to go to church every week and we'll use this example say okay well what if I were to give you this Bible as a gift but I said you have to do what I say or else I'm not going to give this to you. I'm going to give this to you, but if you don't come to my church every week, if you don't pray, if you don't do all these other good things, then I'm going to take it back from you. Who gives a gift like that? That's not a gift. That's like a contract. That's like saying you must do all of these things or else this, does not, this is not yours. It's not truly yours. But if you're giving a gift, the ownership transfers as soon as you give it. I have no more say over a matter of a gift once I've given it to you. That's what a gift truly is. So when God gives us the gift of eternal life, it's not something that he holds over our head and says, okay, now you need to keep going to church. You need to keep praying. Wait, don't sin. Like, don't. Well, you can't murder somebody or else I'm just going to come and take that back because that's not a gift. That's you working for something. That, you don't have possession of that gift if that's the way that, that it works. That's no longer a gift. By definition, it's not a gift. So I'll use that example. The other one, I actually prefer using this one. I usually use a gift for people who are younger, maybe people who don't have children, um, especially younger kids. They understand what a gift is. They have birthdays. Maybe they probably celebrate Christmas. They receive gifts from people. They know what a gift is. But being born again, you can also understand this illustration as well, but I think it hits home really, really close with parents. Jesus Christ says in John chapter 3, I've got that reference here that we must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. John chapter 1, I don't think I have this on the notes, explains that as many as received him to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So you kind of explain, okay, look, we're born again when we put our faith in Christ. That's all we have to do. It's the same thing we have to do to receive that gift of eternal life. It's the same thing we need to do to be saved. He's just using different um, words of ways of saying the same exact thing. We believe on him. Hey, we're born again. We become a child of God. Spiritually, when our spirit is born again, we become God's sons. He becomes our father. And I love this illustration because I'll tell people, look, I have three girls. I have rules for them. Do I expect them to obey my rules? Of course I do. Now, do they always obey my rules? Are any of them perfect? No, of course not. They break my rules sometimes and sometimes they need to be disciplined. Sometimes they get spanked. Sometimes they need to be punished. But it's because I love them. It's not because I hate them. It's because they need it. It's necessary for them to teach them right from wrong. This is no different with God. God has rules for us. He has lots of rules in the Bible. He expects us to follow all of his rules. The same way I expect my children to obey all of my rules. Now, if we choose to disobey God's rules, if you are his child, if you are his son, he will deal with you as a child. He's going to spank you. He's going to discipline you. You will receive for what you've done that's wrong in this lifetime because God wants to correct you because he loves you. He's going to punish you. So it's not like you're just getting away with a bunch of sins. But the same way, no matter what my children do, I am not going to put them in my oven and turn it on broil and lock them in there and just leave them in there forever. God will not do that to his children either. That's what the punishment of hell is. He's locking you up into a burning, fiery furnace and you stay there forever. God does not do that to his children. The Bible says that we're not appointed unto wrath. Hell is a place of God's wrath. If you are a child of God, you are born into his family, you are a part of that family forever. My children cannot, they, they have one mother and one father. It is impossible for them to have another physical father or mother. And once your spirit is born again, it's born of the word of God, that spirit cannot have some other father. God has become your father and you have become his son and you are in his family forever. Those are the two exp explanations I like to use. People have a tendency to, to kind of start to get it and they start, start to understand when you think of it from the parent mentality. Yeah, well, yeah, of course. Like, I am always going to love my children. Even if they never listened to me and never obeyed me, I'm still going to love them because they're my children. 
people could get that. And it's this, you have to, people, you know, we just explained it's the same way with God. God's not going to kick you out of his family because you've sinned, even if it's a bad sin, even if you murder somebody. It's the same thing. Now, what I have on here after these two main illustrations, always ask questions. Because just like I'm doing right now, I'm doing a lot of talking, right? Now, maybe some of you, your mind hasn't been all there hanging on every single word that I'm saying. So when you're preaching the gospel to people, you have to be careful that you don't get so preachy that the other person's not involved in the conversation. It's one thing to know. I mean, you know all this stuff. You know that you're saved. You know that, that God's your father. But we need to engage the person you're talking to so that they, they hear it and they understand it and they're part of the conversation. Their mind doesn't start just wandering off on, on oh, I wonder what I'm going to do later on. This guy's boring me. Because you don't know what's going on inside of their head. But if you can keep somebody engaged, see, you ask questions all throughout the process. And that's why I always, like what if I'm saying the, the example of a gift. Now, if I were to give this gift to you and were to say, you need to give me a dollar, would that be a gift? So I, see, I engage people. And that's what you do at the door because that keeps, you, keeps them right on track with what you're saying. And continue to ask those questions. Well, what, what if my daughter were, were, to, were to just go out and murder someone? Does that mean she's not my daughter anymore? And I wait for an answer. You know, we're, we're talking. We're having a conversation. This is extremely important when you're, when you're giving the gospel to someone. We're not just preaching at them and then saying, okay, bow your head and pray and then leaving. That's ridiculous. They need to understand what the gospel is, understand that it's free, and understand that it lasts forever. Now, one of the ways that I do this after I've kind of gone through and I, I try to, to really get this point across, it's eternal life, it lasts forever, I will use extreme examples as a way to, to gauge what a person believes. And what I mean by that, and I think I probably brought this up in another class, but an extreme example would be, and I always, I always use pretty much the same example. So let's say you have a person when they're 20 years old and they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that person saved? You say, well, we, we already read verses about that. Because by this point, you know, you've already gone through pretty much most of the gospel or all of it. And I'll be like, well, yeah, I mean, the Bible just said you have to believe, right? So they say, yeah, okay, yeah, that, then, then he's saved, right? Yes. Does he have eternal life? Yes. So now let's say 10 years later, the same person, God saw their heart, they believed, right? Okay, they're saved. The same person, though, he loses his job and he starts, he's depressed and he starts drinking. And then drinking turns into doing drugs. And he's still just really upset. And now he's doing drugs and now his life's starting to take a downward turn. And he just, just gets worse and worse and worse. Because he has a drug habit and he doesn't have a job, he starts stealing in order to, to continue to do drugs. One day, while he's stealing, he ends up killing somebody. And he feels so bad about it, he goes home and kills himself. Then the big question is, where, does that, where did that person go? Would that person go to heaven or hell? That gets a lot of people thinking. because, And, and I always ask them why. So if they say he goes to heaven, I'll say why. If they say he's going to go to hell, I say why. What is your reasoning? Why? If they say, well, he's going to hell, why? Well, because he murdered or he commits suicide or he murdered somebody. I mean, you can't just do that. Then that's when you start to explain, okay, well, what does a person have to do to be saved? Did he do that? Did, you know, is it eternal life? Does it truly last forever or does it stop because he commits some bad sin? These are the types of things that really get people to fully understand because it's an extreme example. Obviously, that doesn't happen very often, but that gets to the heart. Someone can give you right answers, but if they believe that that person's going to go to hell because they commit some bad sin, they're not trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation. That gets to the heart of the matter. And then if they say, well, yeah, he's going to go to heaven, I ask why. Usually they'll say, well, because he put his faith in Christ or you know, because he has eternal life or something like that. Then you can be pretty comfortable that they get it. Okay. And this topic is the most important because so many people will hear 
the right things maybe even just just we're saved by grace we're saved by grace through faith we're, you know, like you can hear that over again to the point where you can repeat the right thing and not bad people well-intentioned people but they can just repeat this because you're hearing these things but if they don't quite get it they don't grasp it they don't understand eternal life they don't understand a full gift gift how can they really put their faith and in, in stake in that they can't believe that if they don't understand it they don't even understand what they're believing if that makes sense. That's why this is so important. Now, I have lots of verses on here to help you um, to explain eternal life. One of them, I like Titus 1, 2, and hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God can't lie about eternal life. It's either eternal or it's not. And if God made a promise and said it's eternal, then it's eternal. I already looked at John 3. I'm just going to glance at these real quick. Um, John eleven twenty five. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. You could use that verse to explain, hey, look, the dead are in hell. Death and hell, that's, that people that go there are dead. If you're never going to die, then you will never see the second death because you're never going to die. And he doesn't put any other conditions on there. He says, you live and you believe in me, you're never going to die. Um... Romans 6, Ephesians 2, of course, gift. Romans 11, 6, I like this for people who want to mix works with, with grace, with a gift. Grace is something that's undeserved. Grace is something you receive. It's like a gift. Um, Romans 11, 6 says, and if by grace, then is it no more of work. So in order for something to be grace, it can't have any works. He says, otherwise, grace is no more grace. It's no more grace. If you have to do work to get something, that's not grace. That's not a gift. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. And I'll explain that. Like, when my boss gives me a paycheck, he doesn't say, hey, here's a free gift for you. <laughs> hey, th th this is just by my grace do you receive this paycheck. No, I worked for it. I earned it. It is something that I deserve because I've worked for it. That's why I receive it. It's not a gift. Uh, Romans 4, great passage. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the God. His faith is kind of righteous. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Every once in a while you'll get someone who has a really good point and they're, they're, they're thinking about this and they're saying, okay, well, all we have to do is believe to be saved. And they get that and it's not of works, but they say, but what if, we, what if a person stops believing later? Great verse explains, if we believe not, Yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. This can be tied in with that Titus chapter 1 that says that God, that, you know, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God makes a promise, so he remains faithful to his promise. He's the one that says, okay, if you put your faith in me, I will give you eternal life. Jesus Christ in John 5, 24 says, Who's, um, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth in him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He makes a promise for the future of that person that they shall not come into condemnation, that it's done right now because you believe you have everlasting life at this moment and it's going to last you all the way into the future. Um, God remains faithful to his promise and it's something that goes into the future. Even if you were to stop believing later, and I tie this into my children as well. If my children were to say, I don't believe you're my dad. You lied to me. Someone else is my dad. You're not my dad. Does that make me no longer their dad? Of course not. When you're born again, even if you were to tell God, you're not my father, I don't believe you. I don't believe these are your words. Even if you were to say that, if you were born again, that doesn't change the fact that your spirit is born again. You cannot change that. It's already happened. It's already done. You're already saved. And the last verse, look at that last one on there, Ephesians 1. And one of the reasons why I like this, you can use this when you're out soul winning with our church because on our invitations, I have this verse on there, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. So sometimes I'll even point people to this. And it's something that you can leave them with, with this, with this concept of eternal life. It says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, 
ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And now that's the verse I have on here, but it continues on. It says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. God has sealed us. He seals us with that Holy Spirit and says, you are saved. I've sealed you. You're mine. I bought you. I've paid for you. You belong to me now. And the transaction settled. And that's like the earnest money of the earnest of his inheritance, which is the same way when you go to buy a house, you put earnest money down. You don't get that money back. That goes towards the payment of the house. But that means that you're serious. I'm putting this money down. I'm buying this house. In the same way, God does the same thing with us because the, the transaction isn't complete until we receive our new bodies. And then we're, that, that whole you know, purchase is, is done for. But, the, but it's still, um, it's not like it's up in the air. We're sealed until the day of redemption. So that's what I wanted to cover today. Does anyone have any questions at all? Like on giving examples or anything like that? I mean, pretty straightforward. I know this isn't brand new material either. It's just really important. So what I want to do then with the remaining time is just practice just trying to explain eternal life. You don't have to go through the whole plan of salvation. Just, just try to explain what it means to have eternal life. I mean, you can use some of these verses or w w any other verses that you, you want to use to try to show and just, and just give that explanation of eternal life.